Uh, we're here at Amazon and we have questions from Facebook fans um, for George Martin. Uh, first of all, hi George. Hey, glad to be here. Uh, the first message uh, just isn't a question actually. It says, Dear George R. R. Martin, I don't want to know who Jon Snow's mother is or anything like that. Smiley face. I don't have some special questions. I just want to say thanks for the books you wrote. You are great. Sarah from Croatia. And then in parentheses, Europe. <laughs> so, I well, don't know. It's, um, um, thank you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> that's very kind of you. It's, um, it's, it's my readers that, uh, you know, I really should be thanking. Uh, they've supported me through these years, and word of mouth has uh, made this series the success that it is. There's no, no advertising or promotional campaign can, can take the place of readers talking to other readers and thrusting a book into their hands and saying, hey, you got to read this. And uh, my readers have done that for me, so... They're, they're the, I have the best fans in the world. I've often said that. Uh, the next question is a question from Billy Ray, and he asks, do you consider the ethical, moral stance of every character when you write them? Do you feel there are any characters in your novels that are wholly good, wholly evil? Uh, no, I don't think there are any characters in there who are wholly good or wholly evil. Uh, just as I don't think there are any uh, people in the world who are wholly good or wholly evil. Um, you know, the, it's it's often said Hitler loved dogs, um, and was very was very kind to animals. Um, <clears throat> human beings are complex people. Uh, I've read a lot of history, and uh, it's amazing the things that you 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 find out about people. I mean, people who we think of as heroes who did terrible things in their life, uh, people who we think of as villains who had moments of compassion or kindness or who had uh, people who loved them. Um, I think all of us have it in us to be angels and all of us have it in us to be monsters. Uh, the question is the decisions we make at uh, crucial periods and times of our, of our life. Um, you know, William Faulkner famously said in his uh, Nobel Prize acceptance speech that the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. And uh, I take that from my mantra and uh, try to reflect that uh, any time I create a character. Um, the next question is from John. Uh, it says, in one of the earlier chapters of Dances with Dra Dragons, Tyrion mentions 16 wonders, seven natural and nine man-made. This is going to be a more specific question, I guess. Um, He's not sure if they all get spelled out in the rest of the book. He's only on page 327. They don't. They don't, okay. And he's guessing that the wall and the titan of Bravos are two man-made ones. He's right. Yes. All right, okay. Yes, I, I had a little more about those. You know, Tyrion is known in the books as a voracious reader. So in one of his uh, chapters in an early draft, I had him uh, remembering as he was on this continent, Essos, for the first time. He's never left Westeros before reflecting on uh, these, these books that are written centuries before by a traveler from Westeros who had written uh, wonders and wonders made of man, and there was some paragraphs about uh, what they were. And it was an interesting background story, but it, it kind of slowed the story, so I kept in the, just the oblique reference, but took out the more detailed explanation of it. Um, how do you pronounce Aaron Greyjoy's title, Damn Fair? That's from Rob. I, damp hair. Damp hair. Damp okay. hair. Yes. Okay, damp I suppose hair. I should have put a hyphen in between to make <laughs> That's it clear. All right. This is because he's all wet. <laughs> okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one of your favorite authors, Jack Vance, completed the final volume in his Ports of Call series in 2004. He was 87. He says, how impressed are you by that accomplishment, and would you take the over-under on you beating that mark and finishing your own series? That's from Michael. Um... Well, you know, writers have written for far longer than um, even than, than Vance. I, I mean, Nigel Tranter, the uh, <coughs> great Scottish historical novelist, I think was still producing new works right up until his mid or late 90s. Uh, Jack Williamson, my own dear friend and colleague from New Mexico, was uh, in his late 90s and still still writing right up to the time of his, uh, his death. So, um, you know, I, I hope to finish... Uh, the Ice and Fire series, uh, much sooner than that, but then to go on to write many, many more books, uh, um, some set in Westeros and some set in the Wildcard universe or 
a sequel to Fever Dream, which I've always thought of doing. Uh, um, some ideas, my, my famous unfinished novel, Black and White and Red All Over, I'd like to get back to at some point. I have a, an idea that I've been wanting to write for years about a haunted uh, movie palace uh, called Now Showing at the Castle. Um, you know, I have tons of things I'd like to do, um, and life is short, unfortunately, but I hope it will be long enough for me to do, uh, to do some of these. Uh, I, I have known a few writers who have retired. Um, I cannot imagine ever retiring. I did, I, writing and being a writer is too much part of my identity uh, and too much part of what I am. Uh, I don't know what I would do with all that time if I did stop writing, you know, play video games or something like that, watch a lot more television. I, it seems unlikely to me. Uh, I've always told stories, uh, whether I could make my living from it or even when I was a little kid, uh, just making up stories for the other kids in the neighborhood. And I think I'm going to continue to do that um, until the end. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth? <coughs> And Lisa Orr ask, how do you presume to know the inner workings of such various types of characters, from Brienne to Samwell, Theon to Damp Hair? And how are you able to wrap your head around the thoughts uh, and motivations of so many characters? Well, I, I think the one thing that unites all of these people, as different as they may be in terms of age and sex and religious faith and whatever is that they all are basically human beings. Um, I write some characters who are like me, um, although none of them are precisely like me because I was not born into a medieval feudal society. Um, I write characters who are on the surface at least very unlike me, <coughs> but in every case for the motivating <coughs> emotional power, I have to look inward. I think all writers do that. Uh, you know, the only person we ever truly know is, is ourselves and our hopes, our dreams, our fears, the, the, the things that haunt us at night. Um, so I think the, you need empathy and you need to remember that uh, as different as different types of people may be, we all share a, a common humanity and are, are not ultimately that different from each other. Um. Susan says, of course, I'm only partway through volume two. Uh, after having watched the HBO series and gotten hooked, but is Brand's paralysis mental rather than physical, and thus will he walk again? I don't know if you can answer that question. Well, I won't answer the second half of it, but I will say his, no, his, his paralysis is physical. Jeff asks, uh, you've been called the American Tolkien. How do you, do you feel that that's a fair comparison? Uh, feeling a strange sense of deja vu. Yeah, I wonder uh, if it's the same <laughs> guy we just talked to. <laughs> uh, I'm very flattered to be called the American Tolkien. It's uh, the greatest compliment you can give any fantasy writer, Tolkien. Tolkien essentially created modern fantasy. Fantasy, of course, had existed before Tolkien. It goes all the way back to, um, you know, Gilgamesh and, and Homer. But... Uh, uh, modern fantasy in the shape that we're familiar with it on the newsstands today is, is uh, all following in, in the footsteps of Tolkien. Um, that being said, I'm a, I'm a very different writer than Tolkien. Uh, we're, we're products of very different times. He was uh, born in the 19th century, um, a product of English society at a particular point in time. He served and fought in the trenches of World War I. He was a world-class linguist, an Oxford Don um, of, of academic persuasion. He, he wrote his books largely, uh, I think, for his own amusement and the amusement of his children, working out some particular passions of his, like creating artificial languages. Um, I share none of that. I mean, I'm a baby boomer born in 1948. I come from a blue-collar background in Bayonne, New Jersey, lived in federal housing projects was um, in, involved in the opposition to the Vietnam War um, and have, have largely told stories and, and written as a, as a professional writer uh, for most of my adult life. Um, I have great admiration for Tolkien, but my work is in no sense Tolkien-esque except in the sense of being a secondary world fantasy. 
but I'm still flattered by the comparison. I mean, it's, you know, I'm being compared to one of the greatest that ever was, and uh, who, could, who could object to that? Mm -hmm. um, I guess you don't always know what kind of questions are going to come up, but the mark of Bor Borel, is that how you say that? The mark of Borel? You know okay, what what, yes. The he says, uh, this is Calico, says, I think I missed something because I can't figure out what it is. Is that a question you can answer? The mark of Borel. Yeah. <coughs> well, uh, he might be referring to, uh, there's one particular family, a very minor family who appears in only one chapter, uh, but they're islanders, and I mentioned that there's, they, they have webbed fingers mm -hmm. uh, and toes there. Uh, a trait that runs in their lineage going back generations. Some of them have it, some of them don't. So uh, that may be what he's referring to. We, our, I guess our fans dig deep. <laughs> they, they do, yes. <laughs> um, this is a question uh, that asks if you have a favorite character in the series. Tyr Tyrion. And why? Because he's fun. <laughs> All right. Um, Cynthia asks, are wildlings related to the humans? Um, Wildlings are humans. Yeah. That's they're just humans who happen to live beyond the wall. And, uh, you know, their culture has evolved differently because they're not subject to kings or lords or lords. And uh, they're, they're more of a, a tribal society, a village society, living in very harsh uh, conditions. Um, how did you come up with the idea that they... <coughs> this person, Amanda, wants to know why uh, you decided to use different perspectives, uh, character perspectives, uh, chap from chapter to chapter. What made you make that decision? Uh, well, I have a very big story to tell. It's an epic story. It uh, takes place over several continents and a relatively long period of time, and it involves uh, complex politics and war and other things like that. So there's no one possible single character that could possibly tell the entire story. He'd be experiencing part of it, but the rest of it would be occurring on a different continent or on a different half of Westeros. He'd be just hearing about it in a letter or a, or a report. So obviously you need more than a single viewpoint character. Now the other way to go would be omniscient viewpoint where I'm just God and, and uh, I'm looking down at the player's but omniscient viewpoint, uh, I've never liked that as a reader. Um, I think we don't experience, none of us are God. When we experience life, we, we see it through a particular viewpoint. You know, I'm looking at you, you're looking at me. We're not, we're not above looking down on the two of us here. Uh, you know, you don't see, if someone was sneaking up behind you with a knife, you wouldn't necessarily see that person, but I might. So it makes a huge difference in whose viewpoint we, uh, we tell that particular incident from. Um, that's the way we experience life. That's the way we should experience fiction, I believe. Um, so therefore, with given the size of the story and my belief about third-person viewpoint being the way to do it, a series of third-person viewpoints so you can present all sides of a large canvas was the logical way to go. All right. <coughs> um, Drew wants to know exactly what were your interests as a child that possibly influenced your writing as an adult? Um, well, I was, I, you know, I suppose today you'd say I was a geek uh, or, an, or a nerd uh, in terms of my interests as a kid. I read comic books. I read science fiction and fantasy. I lived a lot in my own in my own mind. I played a lot of games. You know, we didn't have video games back then, but I played board games like Risk and um, Monopoly and so forth. Um, but I think one of the big things that influenced me in my taste was was our uh, financial situation. I mean, my we never had much money in my family. We lived in the projects. Um, we didn't even own a car. We never went anywhere. My, my world was sort of bounded. I, I lived on First Street in Bayonne. My school was on Fifth Street. It's like 99% of my life was spent between First Street and Fifth Street in those uh, little five block uh, area. Um, <clears throat> but Bayonne is a peninsula. And um, we have New York Bay on one side, Newark Bay on the other side, and the two bodies of water connected by a deep water channel called the Kilvan Cull. 
And the projects that I lived in happened to be right on First Street, so directly across from us was the Kilvon Cull, and beyond that, Staten Island. And it's a deep water channel where many ships bound for Port Newark come and go. So I was a kid who never went anywhere, not even like to the lake or uh, to New York City, which was not too far away. Uh, and yet I would watch these big ships pass every day and all through the night with flags from all around the world, from, from China and Liberia and South America. Uh, and I'd start to imagine all these places. And it, it, I, I think it woke a hunger in me for seeing distant wonders and then creating distant wonders, making up stories about the, the places I would go, the things I would see, or, you know, transposed to my characters. <coughs> so, um, I took the travels in my imagination that I was not able to take in, uh, in my actual life and have continued to do so. Um, I'll just ask a few more questions. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time left. Um, <clears throat> Janelle wants to know how much influence do your fans have on your writing? Not very much. I mean, um, I love my fans. I'm grateful that they love the stories, but um, art is not a not a democracy. Um, so I try not to be influenced by my fans. I mean, one of the things that drove me crazy in Hollywood was uh, the attempts in the film and television industry to to test everything. You know, you do a pilot and they they screen it for a focus group, and you know make question them and make them fill out questionnaires. Did you like the hero? Did you like him doing this? And then you get back reports. Oh, the focus group didn't like the hero. Uh, you know, can you make him more likable? And, you know, I don't... That, that's commerce. They're trying to produce the most popular product, one that will make money for the corporation. I understand that. But it's not art. And what I'm about is, is art. art. You don't get to vote on art. You, you don't get to say, you know, this Captain Ahab, he's very unlikable. Can't we make him more like the captain in the love boat? Then people would like him better, you know. Um, uh, leg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who wants to see this one-legged guy? He's very grouchy. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that. I want to tell my stories and, uh, you know, put them out there. And some people are going to like them, some people aren't going to like them. Fortunately, I, I found a lot of people who like them enough to, uh, for me to make a living at, and, and that's fine. But uh, it's great when the fans come up to me and say, I love your books. You know, they've, they've made a difference in my life that pleases me no end. And some of them say, I don't like your books. You know, I, they were, there was too much sex for me. They were too violent for me. Or alternatively, they were too slow for me. Or you know, well, that's fine. They're entitled to their opinion. There are a lot of other books out there that they can buy, you know, that uh, they might like better, but uh, I wouldn't like and my readers wouldn't like. I mean, that's, you, you pay your money and you take your choice, and the world is full of choices. We see many of them here behind us, and uh, uh, that's fine, but I, I don't want to be influenced in the act of creation, whether it's by a network executive or by my fans. All right, I'll do one more question, which I'm sort of grabbing randomly. Um, this is from Jolene. She says, what was your intent in providing such female characters of strength in a genre that typically reduces women to witches, wives, and or whores? Well, to be fair, I have my share of all of those uh, witches, <laughs> wives, and whores. Uh, but I try to make them fully fleshed out uh, human witches, wives, and whores, and as well to introduce other things. Well, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about common, common humanity. Um, I, it's, it seems strange that I have to say this. It's sort of a weirdly radical statement, but women are people, <laughs> and they're driven by the same desires that uh, that drive men, I think, uh, you know, a desire for respect and power, uh, a desire to protect their children, um, greed for money, for acclaim, uh, everybody wants to be loved. It's all common humanity, and I just try to write my female characters uh, as I write my male characters, you know, with, you know, I, I do take into account that it's a very patriarchal society, so they're, they are limited to certain roles, and some of them fit comfortably within the roles that their Westerosi society has assigned them, and some of them 
do not fit comfortably into those roles and therefore encounter a certain amount of uh, rejection or tension or ridicule as they as they try to pursue their own dreams or as they frustrate their own dreams and all this is great all this is is conflict it's it's character tension it's it's what story is all about the human heart in conflict with itself once again um, and you know one of the things that pleases me no end is that I have so many women readers uh, and that they they do write me all the time and say that they really like my female characters so that uh, I, I am very pleased with that um, well George we got dozens and dozens and dozens more questions but I'm gonna have to call it quits right now okay Thanks. well we'll do it again next book yeah absolutely <laughs> congratulations on all your success oh, thank great. you yeah. thanks for having me You're welcome